This fan base is amazing. The city of Cincinnati is amazing, and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Desmond takes a handoff run to the right. He's got all sorts of room to the 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown! Hello, listeners, new and old. Welcome back to your favorite Bearcats podcast, Viva La Cats, now proudly presented by the Big 12's premier network, the 1012 Network. I am your host, Justin House, accompanied by my friend, Steve Maurer, who is very well dressed today. And we are here to bring you the very best of the Bearcats every single week, sometimes in our standard weekly previews, but usually in our standard weekly previews, not our usual Twitter spaces, which are every so once in a while now. I never get this intro right. It's always a mess, but whatever. You're here. We're here. We're talking Bearcats. Um, to get right to it, we've got a very special guest on here today. Some of you may know his name. If you don't, uh, you will after this. He is very fun to listen to, very fun to talk to. So make sure to check out Paul Fritchner. You will hear more from him later in our episode. But to start off, Bearcats losing to Memphis on the road. Close game. Let it slip through your fingers once again. And the question remains, can the Bearcats close out? It has been answered a couple times. Yes, many times. No, and it still hurts. Uh, Too many turnovers, not enough defense. Um, Something's working there. And I don't know if it's necessarily the Bearcats fault, but something to the tune of 20 turnovers feels like it is. Steve, catch us up. Yeah, um, it was just not the day that UC wanted to play. Uh, Justin Williams' analysis, uh, which I agreed with after watching uh, some of the replay again and some of the highlights, um, he he mentioned that you know Memphis uh, had a game plan to just get up in UC's shirt, get real close to them, and cause turnovers. And we've seen this year, if UC gets some space, get some open threes off, then they can add up a quick number of points. And it's just in that close range which is we saw it as early as the NKU game when our guards were driving and three dudes would just come and just stand over them and block them. Like uh, we're, we're not great when we have like man up, like in our shirt, in our mm-hmm. face, right on us. And it, it's hard to be good at that. Obviously you have to have some really talented players. So I'm not putting that all on our guys like Memphis credit to them credit to Penny. I've been getting a lot of Penny jokes off ever <laughs> since he got there, but uh, he's been, He's turned it around. He, they finally made the tournament last year, and they look to be a pretty sure lock of, for the tournament again this year. So um, it was just, you know, like one of those games where you wish you could have changed a couple of things. And, you know, because the score was so close to the end and because you had a couple opportunities to tie it up, maybe even take it over overtime, maybe even win it at the buzzer and join the craziness from the past college basketball weekend and be like the final buzzer yep. beater out of like five, like, it would have been nuts, but it wasn't to be. Yep. And I think this game, uh, for me, I just see this very similarly to how a lot of Bearcats games have gone against the tougher opposition. It has always been the Bearcats being able to compete for the first seven to 10 minutes. And then the other team just pulls away. And it's this long uphill battle until finally it comes together at the end. And then we fall short. I think it would be less painful if we just couldn't get caught up. But every time we get there right at the end, we go on a little run with like a minute left when we're down. And it's so funny because like, I I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just the curse of being like having the lead, but almost every single game this year where the Bearcats have been down, they fought back in the last two minutes and made it like a one possession game. And every single game where they've been up, and it's been like a 10 point game with a couple minutes to go, we crumble and it becomes a one possession game. So I don't know what it is, but something about the Bearcats having games where everything has to be one possession with 30 seconds to go sucks because usually we don't come out on the right end of it. But the past few we have this one, unfortunately we did not. The Bearcats are now at 19 and 11 on the season, still searching for win number 20. 
Hopefully that will come against SMU. Uh, we didn't really have on the rundown here to do an SMU preview per se, but uh, we will be talking about senior day, which will be part of SMU. And honestly, there's a lot of conversation going on right now. Um, we found out through Justin Williams today that the Bearcats will only be having David DeJulius, Rob Finnessy, and Kalu Zikbe as part of the senior day ceremony, which means other seniors such as John Newman, Jeremiah Davenport, Micah Adams-Woods, et cetera, those guys will not be participating, which says a lot because a guy like John Newman will then most likely be using his medical redshirt year to come back again next year. Davenport, Mike Adams Woods, you can assume will then be back next year because of this conversation. Now, how did that, how does that pan out? We don't know, but it is interesting nonetheless, because this, uh, a situation where you could have potentially seven guys out there on the court this year for senior day ceremonies has now been cut down to three. And it's the only guys who have zero eligibility left. Yeah. Yeah, definitely weird. And uh, I was, I actually happened to be at Arizona State's senior day uh, a couple Saturdays ago and they had seven dudes out there and the ceremony, like it was, it felt kind of rushed. Like you didn't get like, you know, that each guy got a minute to walk out there. Like, you know, in senior days of past, obviously the Kenyon Martin one is probably the most famous senior day in Cincinnati basketball history where he got to walk out there, hug coach Huggins and wave to all the fans. Like, I feel like that moment was kind of robbed from like those Arizona state guys. Obviously there's no Kenya Martins in that group, but <laughs> I, I do like that. Obviously like it probably wasn't a conscious thought at all, but it's probably nice for those three guys to get their shine. And especially David DeJulius, who's been part of some lean years here with the program and you know, we, but he still put his heart and soul in every game. And like, I hope the people who can be there can go there and support, David to Julius support Kalu Zikbe support Rob Finnessy. Man, I also feel for Rob Finnessy too. Like I'm sure he wanted his senior year to go way better than it did. So, but mm -hmm. I hope those guys get the recognition they deserve. But you know, also give it getting three, it gives them like the proper moment. It doesn't feel right. rushed at all. It gives them all a chance to just, you know, it's soak it in. But you're right though, Justin. It is a thing that we actually did talk about with Paul Fritschner, and you'll hear, hear that later about just the roster. Um, moves that are going to happen this off season. And that I I'm very interested in this because obviously we have three guys going out as of now, three guys coming in as of now, but you could have up to four or five more guys leaving your roster, just depending on, you know, transfer portal. If John Newman's medical red shirt gets accepted and like just whatever, whoever decides to stay, leave. So, so on and so forth. Uh, maybe even the Bearcats get another high school recruit who's been talked about a lot. I don't want to <laughs> say his name because I don't want to get my hopes up, but, um, but it know, rhymes I, with I, Gory Ladonga. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just keep saying that as his name, even when, if, if, if he doesn't come here, we got to just give a Gory Ladunga update. Gory, Gory Ladunga. Ladunga. <laughs> That's our first podcast inside joke you had to be there respond to <laughs> us with gory ladunga and you'll get our first pizza piece of merch whenever we produce it gory your ladunga. first free pizza from viva la cats <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it's just it's gonna be interesting to see you know i don't want to say that i'm ready for the off season because i love bearcats basketball and i want to just stay around as long as we can but once that last game is over it's going to be very interesting to see what happens over the next couple months with the roster yeah, absolutely. This this situation that we have on our hands here is we're in a very volatile time in the Bearcats roster, makeup, transfer portal. All this kind of stuff is happening at the same time. We're we're in a position where, you know, the transfer portal is used more than ever now. You have NIL, which comes into factor of are you paying your guys? How much are you paying your guys to stick around? How much are you paying guys who have been here to stick around? Things like that. It, it's going to, it's going to factor into a lot of these decisions and there's going to be expectations on both sides from a, you know, team athletic department side of things of how much you're going to give these players. And then there's also going to be an expectation from the players of how much they think they should be making. And can they get a better deal somewhere else? And so 
I think there's so many varying factors that are attributed to this year that have not necessarily been a part of that case. And then you add on the layers of all of the conversations going on this season. And I think it makes for a very interesting off season. Like you said, um, I want to talk on this real quick because we don't exactly cover this point specifically um, with Paul later, but I'm curious from your side, what do you think of Ma and DDJ? Do you think that these four year guys should stay? Do you think they should go? What do you think should be done with those roster spots if they do go? Well, uh, for me, Jeremiah Davenport, he has the city skyline in the Bearcat eyes literally <laughs> tattooed on his chest. So that man, I understand all the criticism, and I did say something completely different in our group meet today, but <laughs> listeners, you listen to me now. This is what I have to say now because I'm allowed to change my mind. And you guys <laughs> didn't read that anyway, uh, the listening <laughs> audience. DDJ, man, you can stay as long as you like. Like, I, I completely Well, yeah, I would hope DDJ wrong. could stay long. <laughs> Dang, you <laughs> said DDJ first, and now did you I say DDJ? Say I meant so. I meant to say Dab. Yes. I hope I okay. Well, sorry, Dab. It's it's so much better to say three three name abbreviations rather yeah. than just you know just an, just the DAV. Name. But <laughs> yeah, Jeremiah Davenport. Um, I do think you know uh, there's obviously some criticism, but I think as the season has gone on and he's accepted his role coming off the bench, I think he's been a positive member of this team and. Obviously, you know, like we don't, I don't want to critique him right now because he's still on the recruiting pitch and I would love to have him back. But I also think it's something too about, you know, building culture. And you've talked about this, Justin, like how many guys stayed all four or five years, their entire time of their eligibility staying as Bearcats. I do think that's important. And like, it just for me, like I, if both of those guys decide to stay, I think that would be great. Um, You know, they, they, they're, they're teammates and maybe they should figure out, you know, maybe Micah plays a few less minutes or like let's day day or shows day day the ropes. Like, I mean, Micah's not like he he's been good for, for the Bearcats and like, he's never been played completely off the court, which is I think a good thing. And I, I do like think it's important to keep these guys around. And I know I, I told you I changed my <laughs> tunes, so I'm self admitting it, but just the romantic side of me wants to see these guys be rewarded for their, Mm -hmm. for staying with the program through the lows. And if they get to like, they, maybe they won't get to the tournament this year, but if they are able to like somehow get to the tournament next year, that would be all the validation in the world for those guys. Yeah. I mean, and obviously, you know, which side of this argument I'm on. Um, I think when it comes to both of them, I think I would like both of them on there. If you're coming down to splitting hairs and you got to choose one side or the other, if you're only able to take one personally, I would still prefer Dav because I think what you look at with a guy like day day coming in, when, when you, when you have the ability to upgrade potential for the, you know, classic point guard position, I think Ma is great, and I think he's provided a lot, and I think Dav has done the same thing. I just see the skill set being a little bit different. I will say to the same effect, for Dav's case, this is one thing where I don't – I have not seen this conversation actually at all, so I'm going to bring this up now. haven't seen this conversation at all when we're talking about team makeup. When you talk about team makeup, Dav is in a really interesting position because – there are two or three or four copies of him in the team when it comes to size, not necessarily performance, but when it comes to size, when it comes to length, when it comes to like positional, like the way that they play efficiency, nobody, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about any kind of actual in game, but by the makeup, he has copies and he has other people that could step into his position. To the other effect, he is the most experienced person on the team. I will also say this, and I'm going to knock on wood because I'm not going to be the dick who ends up having something happen. And if it does, I wasn't, it's not my fault. Nothing happened. (laughs) 
He has been incredibly healthy. And I don't think, I think so many people overlook that. This guy played 31 games last year. He's played 30 and still has more to play this year. That is really hard to get. Look at John Newman. Look at Rob Finnessy. Look at Victor Locken. Look at these guys who are more injury prone and, and who great. You have them on the roster, but, and, and maybe, maybe they're more consistent here, or maybe they're better in this position or whatever it might be. That's great and all, but it doesn't mean shit when they're not playing. And when you have a guy who can go and get you 10, who could get you 20, 20 plus in a night. And sure, the volume might not be exactly there, but I want to go back to a point that I researched earlier today. JD's shooting percentage throughout the year, November, December, January, 32%. His shooting average on the year is 35%. February alone in these past eight games, 43%. And that was a lot to the tune of West changing his approach. The minute reduction now has actually gotten a little bit higher back to the starting 30 minutes or so, not back in the starting lineup, but he's juiced his game up a lot and he's been able to play a lot more consistently. And so I think we're seeing that evolution and like the change in mindset that we all wanted. And I think it's really interesting too, because it's funny because a lot of people wanted a minute reduction in a role reduction for JD. He got that and he's done much better. And it's also to the tune of people are like, I want JD gone. I don't want to deal with this guy who is a liability quote unquote. And now he's performing well and people just totally overlook it because, well, they're, they're so stubborn and they're so stuck on the fact that like what he was, he has elevated his game and he's changed a lot. And sure. He might not be at like that 2020 where he was like 40, what was it? Like 42, 43% from the three. It was insane. He was hit last year. He was hit. <laughs> he was hitting last year. He was like 39% from the three. And so, you know, when your role changes, I just think it's so interesting because so many people argued this was our exact argument. We've had this conversation too. He can't be the first guy. He can't be the second guy. He should be the third or the fourth. Now he is, and it's working. And so like, if that's what you're expecting and you go into next year and you're going to be bleeding out, you're going to lose the gut, a lot of these guys on the team. You need somebody to be able to step into the shoes of DDJ. You need somebody to be able to fill that role. And especially when it comes to veteran leadership and keeping continuity between the team and seeing how these guys are going to perform on a different level, I would so much rather go with a guy that I know the ceiling and the floor with than the guy that I know nothing about. And, and that's yeah. just the reality of it. And it's like I said, um, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, and we can move on after this, but those two guys also like, they know what it's like for us to be like, on the cusp of the tournament good like they were there yeah. on that 2019 2020 team like they they were around that team and you know like, that was I a tournament team too there, yeah there, there's got to be something to that you know just like having them like just be involved and be around for that you know just like i think that's got to be something that you value in your program so i definitely understand like where people are coming from if they don't want them back but just from like the sentimental standpoint, I want all my guys to be Bearcats forever, you know, and I understand yep. they're not going to be like, you know, it's sometimes, you know, you got to find a better fit for yourself and maybe we'll see a couple guys end up doing that this year, but you know, we, we should all be rooting for these guys to stay and contribute as they can. Plus, I mean, I've been wanting a, a Jeremiah Davenport type three and D well, three point guy. <laughs> Like I, I've wanted one three-point shooter to come into UC and just step in and knock down some threes off the bench. Jeremiah Davenport this year. I mean, forty-three mm percent. -hmm. I it's asking a lot. Maybe we could get up to like forty-five or like forty-four, <laughs> just for like the Eric Davis type number, you know. But uh, I mean, forty-three percent a month. Like that's pretty good. And if he can sustain that, if he can sustain that over an entire season, and we run more looks to get him open shots and run him off ball screens, like somehow find more ways to get him open in the corner or draw other, draw people to Landers or Vic and find a way to get Dab open. When he steps into it, it's usually, it's been pure recently. So, and yeah. it's not him just jacking up just a, a shot to just get like five seconds into the shot clock. It's, 
usually been mm. open looks and he's been knocking them down a lot more lately. So, yeah, this is but, my very last two second point on this too. I think that he's been in a very interesting position with how his role has changed. What I would like to see is a lot of what we saw when he was very new in the program. I want to see him as a three and slasher. I want to see him attack the bucket too, because even if he's not making those shots, he is a very good shooter from the line. And I just don't think he has enough volume at the line to really represent how good of a shooter or how good of a free throw shooter he is. And, and it's, you know, of course, we didn't get the one that we needed and two or three, whatever, at the end of the game against Memphis. But of course, across the whole course of the season, I think he's in a very good position to be able to grow with his team. And next year, it just feels right. And so I think that's Maybe enough. He's on got that. to wear number one again, Justin. Maybe he's got yeah. to wear number one and just break break it back out just for yeah. his, his final year. You know, who knows? Maybe he'll find it back again. But all of that has been said. That is enough coverage on basketball. We have the weekly Bearcat sports wrap up for you. There is a lot that has happened, a lot to cover, and a lot of dubs too, which feels pretty good. So, Steve, give us the countdown timer. We're going to keep it within two minutes and 20 seconds, and I'm actually going to put it up this time. Still, like every week, screw you, Elon Musk. We're not paying for Twitter Blue. I need to make that like a t shirt. That's like prime Viva La Cats merch. Well, um, our friend CapEx might want to join you on that, you know, because that's <laughs> been like his his uh, um, little little part of like saving eight dollars, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, in, in his title. So maybe we can collab on that. We, we finally come together on something and it's not paying <laughs> for Twitter blue. So. <laughs> All right, Justin, if you're ready, I'm going to start the timer in three, two. One. All righty, folks, we are going to start with Bearcats track and field. The Bearcats this week, they won the men's indoor conference championship. First indoor conference championship since 1995. First uh, track and field conference championship for the men since 2004. Women's team plays second for the fourth year in a row. I'm going to read off all of our conference title uh, winners real quick. Riley Penn, Fred Mudani, Stephen M. McElroy, Corbin Spencer, Taylor Beard, Cameron Licht, Gren Stare, Alicia Thorpe, Jack Barchett, Matt Hoke, David Endress, and Tyler Worth. Congratulations. Justin, let's take it to the lacrosse field. That's a lot of names. We are playing the bad guys up north, playing at Ohio State today and at Louisville on Friday. And just to catch up with that, oh, man, we dropped a heartbreaker in OT to those Ohio State suck guys. So man. sorry, but let's let's get it back against Louisville on Friday. On to the tennis court, they fin- they defeated Western Kentucky 6-1 to in their final indoor match and will take a couple weeks off before they head outside to the Talbert Turbot Tennis Center. Justin, what about men's golf? Shout out to those guys. Off to the links. These boys finished in first place at the Dorado Beach Invitational. Huge, big ups to those boys. Keep it going because we love to see success in golf. A minus 41 for the team this week. So shout out to them. Uh, women's basketball now lost to Saturday, UCF Saturday and hosting USF tonight as you listen Wednesday for senior night. Thank you to our seniors, Deja Trotter, Caitlin Wilson, Jada and Jaden Scott, Maya Jackson and Sophia Grizzali. And Justin, finish us off with some soccer. Bearcats defeated Miami in their first game of the spring season. And that is the Bearcat sports wrap up. Did we keep it in the timer? In two, uh, uh, just under two minutes, even. So, all right, how about perfect. That? Well, Ring the damn bell. Miami sucks. <laughs> Miami still sucks. When are they ever good at anything? Ivy uh, League of the West, oh, my well, ass. I, I'm, I have a, um, I have a something I want to bring up on Miami as we get into our next sport here. But I do want to just note real quick that football, Justin, we're going to have a spring game this year. We're actually going to do it. We're, We're not going to just it. hide the bubble away and not uh, expose our program at all. Uh, <laughs> that's been a sticking point for some fans over the past couple of years. But April 15th, noon, Nippert Stadium, we will have an official spring game. What do you think about that? I think it's going to be nice. Like it, it just gives people an opportunity to go out, get first looks. It's going to be really interesting to see because there's a lot of changes happening here. So. 
I don't know. And, uh, I think people you, want to know what's happening in the quarterback. That would be very interesting. Uh, you know, you see, if you did, I, I hope we're going to put this on ESPN Plus because um, your boy is from out of town. We need to see this. Yep. We, we got a <laughs> podcast to do, baby. We, we, we're, we're probably not going to be able to be there, you know, just fly in for the weekend. So For those of you who um, can be there, just like live stream it for us. Just do it on your phone and just somebody give commentary, please. I mean, Justin, I do have a hookup in the video department, so maybe mm. you never know. We get a lot, <laughs> but um, give us all the film. Uh, we'll we'll see. But yes, we are publicizing our program this year, and I'm happy about that. Okay, Justin, on to the baseball diamond this this uh, from this past weekend for a little recap for you. Um, we did unfortunately drop three straight to number seven, Florida. Um, they. The Gators are just good, man. I don't know what to tell you. Like, they're going to be a really good team all year. Uh, they probably got a bunch of, like, pros on their team, too. Like, they're they're good, man. So, um, no no need to hang your head in defeat. I don't think UC's won, uh, won a game in one of those series in a while. And, you know, it's just, it stinks. It's always going to be hard to play against teams uh, that, you know, are down south and have been, you know, like, to be frank, uh, had a head start and really, like, recruiting and getting people to the baseball program. And um, I do think this is something that as we enter the big 12 and as we keep building off of that success from 2019, this is like an avenue where this is an easy goal, like win a series against the SEC team on the road or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And the, I think you can just build off of that, but you know, we'll, we'll just say it was goal building for the future. I don't want to read have, the second stat because uh, it was too painful. Go ahead. I have one question, one question for you very quickly. If you could do anything with any amount of money, well, maybe not any amount of money, a reasonable amount of money from the athletic department and you, Steve, are in charge of the baseball team, what do you do in order to recruit more players here that you can steal away from bigger programs like Florida? Pay them. <laughs> no. all right um, maybe well um well actually i would probably just say you know maybe we like move a conference series down to like great american ballpark for a weekend or something i don't know mm. do something cool like that um realistically though i would probably just say you know we just keep trying to build off of like you know guys like joey weimer who were in uh in spring training with the brewers like our guy ian happ you just keep building off of guys like that. So hopefully like eventually we'll keep building. Uh, I did see Cam Aldred pitch for the pirates today. He former uh, UC baseball pitcher. So shout out to him. Um, and I, I think you just build off of that and you try to, maybe you just install a sauna in the clubhouse. I don't know. We, <laughs> we got to get some, some of these warm uh, climate guys up to Cincinnati. So, but <laughs> there is some good baseball being played in the Midwest. So I don't want to knock true. them either, but. Any good baseball players, come on down to UC, baby. We'll, we're going to have a good time, So, uh, nice. especially as we go into the Big 12. Um, so shout out to – I want to do give a shout out real quick to Ryan Nicholson. Went four for 12 over the weekend with two walks, a double, triple, and a home run, slugging 800 so far this year, and he's got an OPS of 1250. So uh, pretty good. That sounds pretty good. Um, <laughs> lead, leading the team. Um, Cincinnati is ranked 27th in RPI, but that's mostly banked on based on Florida being ranked seventh and UC <laughs> beating a team that's in the 200s. So I wouldn't really put much <laughs> stock into that. Um, now the Bearcats do get a chance to redeem themselves against, uh, in the home opener at UC baseball stadium tonight against Miami of Ohio. Justin, can you tell me their record this year so far? Uh, oh, and seven. And just like every other oh, sport, they suck. They suck. Uh, haven't beaten them in a while, so this would be an opportune time to do it. Um, Mr. Googs T, uh, could, if you could do that, that'd be great. And they do play against North Alabama for a four-game set this weekend. North Alabama, they just swept Miami in uh, four games at home. So shout out to the Golden Lions of North Alabama. Don't play that well this weekend. Let, us, let the Bearcats get some dubs. Uh, I just want to say, too, it's supposed to be beautiful tonight as you're listening up in Clifton, uh, 70 degree weather, not a cloud in the sky. And you know, that's baseball weather. So get on out there, support your natty boys, the diamond cats, hum cats, hum cats. Um, and let's uh, get a win over Miami. Someone bring a bell. Bing, 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 bing. 
<laughs> Speaking of bells ringing, there are bells ringing around our heads as we are launching the Cat Skeller Social Club. Welcome Woo-hoo! to those of you who may be new listeners. Uh, we should have said that earlier at the top of the show, but we're talking about it now. Cat Skeller Social Club is something that we have been having in the works for a while. We kept saying, Oh, you know, there's something coming. Well, this is the something that was coming. Um, we have partnered with our friends over at Cincy Slangin and at Go Beer Cats to create Cat Skeller Social Club. This is an environment where we're trying to just pull people together, let people speak how they want to speak, make community around this, try to provide more content around the Bear Cats, try to create a nice laid back atmosphere that's a little bit more drama free. And just try to make sure that everyone can get everything that they need to know in one central place. We'll be providing writing. We'll be providing video content. We'll obviously have our podcast up there. So if you haven't already, make sure to go check out the site. That is catskellersocial.club. Dot club, not dot com. Catskellersocial.club. And that is where you can find... All of that information, you can check out our episodes there. You can check out Cincy Slang and Go Beer Cats there, as well as all the writings that we'll be putting up. We're going to try to have previews of games, reviews of games, deep dives on the topics. You can hear me bullshit about a bunch of stuff. You can hear Steve bullshit about a bunch of stuff and anybody you want to. So make sure to check that out, Steve. Let us know if you've got anything else on that. Yeah, man, we just want to bring more Bearcats coverage as uh, the athletic department enters the Big 12. We want to bring it from a different side. And, um, you know, I've been talking to a lot of people and they're interested in hearing another side of Bearcats athletics coverage. And we want to bring it to you. So let us know if you have any ideas for things you want to see in the future. We would love to have you involved. We even have an opportunity for you to contribute to our site. You can even fill it out and say, hey. I want to write for you guys, or I want to join your podcast, or however you want to contribute. It's as uh, my Bane, my man Bane would say, it's for the people, (laughs) for the people who have been liberated from the blind. Liberated from the blindness. (laughs) You merely adopted the dark. I was born in it, molded by it. What really this contributing opportunity is for is to tell us how bad our podcast is and how you can do it better. Uh, If you're (laughs) listening this long, you definitely get a chance to do that. So shout out to you, dear listener. So, and you haven't even listened long enough because we still have another interview coming (laughs) up for you. Maybe we should splice that in a little bit more. We're really milking this one out before they get to Paul. Eh, We'll, we'll well, put the, we'll we'll put the numbers in there. If you want to skip to just listen to Paul, that's fine. We'll have it in the description. It's okay. Justice I know. Defeated. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 a good conversation. Paul knows his stuff and he's fun and uh, uh, maybe a little less bullshit than we have. But he knows more again, than me. <laughs> make sure to check out Cat Skeller Social Club. It is very exciting for us. We hope that it'll be exciting for you guys too and something that you could stay tuned into and maybe just get that daily wrap up that you want. We're going to try to keep providing this weekly wrap up. Because again, we think that that's a little bit of a hole that we haven't really had represented and we do want to give more light, shine, shine more light on the programs around our athletic department that maybe don't get as much conversation around them. So again, thank you guys for checking us out this week. Steve's got one more thing. He's got his finger up. What do you got? Cat Skeller Social Club rule number one, tell every Bearcat fan, you know about the Cat Scaler Social Club. Justin, you can clip that. Spread it across <laughs> Bearcat country. Spread it across the world. CatScalerSocial.club. Join in. Let's go. Go. Can't Bearcats. believe I almost forgot about that. Thank you, Steve. Keeping me in check. So again, thank you guys for listening this week. If you aren't already, make sure to follow us on Spotify, Apple Pods, or whatever platform you listen to. Also, make sure to check out us on YouTube if you are not watching our episodes because then you get to see all our little fingers and my camera going in and out of focus and a lot of bunch of other bullshit so check us out there check out cat Skeller social club check out our friends check out paul fritzner stay tuned for this uh interview with him that will be on in about 15 seconds so again thanks for listening guys see you next week hopefully with some good news going into the american athletic conference tournament Go Bearcats, baby.
Go Bearcats. Boom. Bosco's Boys is here. I think we all wanted it. And the marriage is officially official. I'm so pumped to bring my show to the 1012 Network. Bosco's Boys. The most consistent K-State podcast out there. Over four years with at least one episode a week. Bringing live shows to the listeners and to the participants every Wednesday at 7 p.m. I'm pumped to be here, and I would love it if you guys came over to Bosco's Boys and gave us a listen. Because we are not Big J Journos. This is a podcast by a fan and his dog for fellow K-State and Big 12 fans. And I can't wait to chop it up with all the members and fans of the 1012 Network. All right, everybody, we now have on our friend Paul Fritschner from Chatterbox Sports and the Rebound Rundown. Uh, We brought him on to talk a little bit about some area basketball, and uh, we have one area basketball team that's obviously near and dear to our hearts. But first, Paul, how are you doing tonight, man? Hey, guys, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. You guys are the best. Um, You you know, this is one of the most fun times of the year, so we're talking college hoops. We're talking Cincinnati area college hoops. This is great. I love it. Uh, so, yeah, let's get right into it. Yeah, so definitely catch Paul every weekday morning on the Rebound Rundown. It's a, a, a little morning commute uh, show. and It's not little. It's a big show. Don't worry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to. A the, tiny the, show. It, it is tiny. It's a, yeah, it's a it's just a, a nightly recap show and preview show. And uh, listen for Paul's pick of the day if you want to make a little extra, you know, cheddar, if you know what I'm saying. It's so. been hot lately, but it wasn't so hot in the beginning of the year. We're making a nice <laughs> little rebound here lately. Yeah, that's for sure. Paul, you won all the bets you've won. You know, you're that's true. Uh, that's a great uh, point. 100 and 0 on all the bets you've won. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> great um, point. I did. We so you know you like talk you talk on the podcast about Cincinnati area basketball teams, and we obviously cover the Bearcats. So we just kind of wanted to get your thoughts just overall so far. Bearcats have one game left in the season. 19 and 11 overall this year. What's your take on West Miller in year two and this team? Well, I think that this season has really been a tale of two seasons in my eyes for Cincinnati. And, you know, I haven't watched every game, but I've watched a lot of games, most of the games this year for Cincinnati. I've caught at least some of it. So to be able to talk about it and and, and to be able to uh, go back and forth and kind of share my opinions on some of this and, You know, when I look at the way that Cincinnati has shifted from the beginning of the year to that to that loss on New Year's Day against Temple and you're sitting there after that loss to Temple and the way that that Temple loss happened. And I know that the I think they lost 70 to 61 in that game. I I don't have the the box score in front of me, but I think that was correct for that game. (laughs) And it was it. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, Okay. I I knew knew it was I knew it was something close. He knows his stuff. Not. I promise I'm not flexing. I didn't look that up. I'm just trying to, I was, I knew it was somewhere like a nine point win. Anyway, the, uh, I, I remember watching that game and thinking to myself, there are, there are issues with this team and can they figure things out? They just looked out of sorts, both ends of the floor. It, it was bad. That was an ugly loss. It was on the road at that point in the season. UC was having a lot of trouble winning away from home. And it was just, it was just a, a, a weird point for Cincinnati where you're thinking to yourself, okay, Wes has only gotten one quad one win in his time here. And that was in the first one way back against Illinois, you know, two in his first season in that exempt event, it hasn't won a quad one game since now you lose, you start the new year with a loss to temple. What's going on here. And then since then, yeah, they've dealt with some injuries, but at the same time, I, I think there's some encouragement in the way that they've dealt with the injuries, you know, Victor Locken being out for a little while. I know the win total isn't where, a lot of Cincinnati fans would want it to be at this point in the season. And I recognize that there's been a lot of issues. Jeremiah Davenport did not play nearly to the level that a lot of people would have liked him to have played this year. But once they shifted his role, he started to fit in better. Once he accepted that role, that he wasn't getting that maybe star look that everybody had thought, well, you know, the Cincinnati kid, he's going to put on the Bearcats uniform. He's going to, he's going to be the guy to a certain extent, maybe not the guy, but, one of the guys and and it just hasn't manifested that way and i know it's frustrating for him for somebody that cares so much about this team and about this city it's frustrating for a guy like that but to his credit 
it seems like at least from the outside, you guys would know better being maybe closer to the program than I am, but it seems like from the outside that he has accepted the role that he's been able to, you know, now find himself in something that fits his style better. And then around it, David DeJulius has had a phenomenal season. I mean, he's been the glue of this team this year. He's been, he's been as good as they could ask him to be time. And again, you look at the buzzer beater that he hit, you know, if you, uh, what it's a week or two away, however long it's been, you know, a couple, a couple weeks, maybe since he said that, I don't, I, it all blends <laughs> together, fellas, at this point in the year, it, it all blends together, but you get the, you get my point that now you get down to this, to this time and you think to yourself, all right, we're about a week away from the American conference tournament. We played Houston real tough at Houston. Frankly, should have won that game. Absolutely should have won that game at Houston. And even the game at Cincinnati, I don't want to say they should have won that game, but it wasn't a blowout. The score might have gotten a little out of hand at the end, but it wasn't a blowout. And so you think to yourself, okay, you're probably going to have to play Houston in the second. In the second, You win the first game of the AAC tournament. You're probably going to have to play Houston in the second game. Well, Houston's a defensive-minded low possession, slow it down type of team to where those types of teams are susceptible to those upsets. Look at what happened Houston mm-hmm. Temple earlier this year. You get those types of teams where they like to slow it down. They like to grind it out. They like to just go low possession and, and win a game 54 to 48 instead of 75 to 71. You're going to find yourself in these games where if you get down by seven, and you can't score at a high rate. Now, that's not to say that Houston can't score at a high rate, but they don't score the ball like some of these other teams that get up and down the floor real quick. So if you get that lead over Houston, which Cincinnati had, and to Houston's credit with their experience and everybody else, their guard play, Marcus Sasser, all the rest, there's a reason they're going to be a number one seed. But that would give me encouragement if I'm Cincinnati here that, hey, maybe, look, we've played the best team in the country as tight as you can play them twice, should have won one of those games, and that game was away. Now maybe on a neutral floor. Yeah. I know it's close to Houston, but still maybe on a neutral floor, you get into a situation where, well, you, you roll the dice out there, and you never know. The problem with Cincinnati, though, in my mind now is, do they get to that Houston game? What Cincinnati team shows up in the first game to be able to get to that Houston game? And, and, and that's just the roll of the dice. Yeah, I definitely would jump on that, too, and say, like, it's – It's always the question of what version of Cincinnati are you going to get? I don't know what just happened to my camera, but (laughs) it just went all blur. But uh, regardless, point still stands is that you never know because this team is just so inconsistent. There's a lot of underlying things that kind of meld this team together that you get a baseline, but it's that ceiling and floor and that ceiling. Sometimes when it hits, it feels great. And when you hit the floor, it's just the team is bottoming out. Um, And so we've kind of run into this issue time and time again throughout a lot of these games. And speaking of games that, um, you know, haven't necessarily gone our way and haven't necessarily been the ceiling. um, Going back to the shootout, uh, a game with a lot of opportunity. (laughs) I don't know what's happening with my camera here. Maybe I can get myself back in focus. We know how much for doing video. You see uh... (laughs) <laughs> the UC athletics department doesn't like your takes, Justin. They have yeah, I guess around. not. They're the censored, censored take. I'm censored. trying to get this to focus. Maybe if I turn my camera off and on. Um, but yes, trying to get back to that game. There we go. There we go. It works now. Um, you know, a, a game where you had an opportunity where, uh, again, this is coming back to Wes and a lot of these Q1 opportunities and saying, do we have what it takes to do this? Does Wes have what it takes to win these games and to win in environments where it is tough. And, you know, this Xavier game that we've had trouble with over the last handful of games, the big 12 is going to feel a lot like that. And it's going to be every single week. Um, So I'm curious too, you know, from your perspective after Xavier's won the last four, um, does the shootout still have juice? Is it, is it dead or (laughs) is it still very alive or what, what is the state of the shootout right now? It'll never die. It very much still has <laughs> juice. I know, I know that it may feel obviously frustrating the way for, you know, for Cincinnati fans, the, the way the last four years have gone, but it still has juice because Cincinnati, once they get to the big 12 will be to a level. Eventually it might not be in year one, but they will eventually get to a level where this is, this becomes a, a competitive series again, albeit, you know, whether that's 
immediately next year, depending on what Cincinnati does in the transfer portal or what Xavier does in the transfer portal. Who knows? Who knows? Just with the way that college athletics have shifted now to a point where your roster can look so entirely different from one year to the next. But as far as the landscape of the of the shootout and, and, and Cincinnati and, and the state of the program in Cincinnati, there are definitely things to be concerned about if you're Cincinnati with going to the Big 12 from a sense of looking at it, as I always like to say, from 30,000 feet, where you haven't made the tournament in a, in a, in a couple of years, haven't 2019, right? Made it in 2019. OK, yep. so nobody so nobody made it in 20 and then 21 and 22. So it's been now three years without a tournament. You're going into the Big 12, haven't won the shootout in four years. And the shootout is at Centos next year. Who knows what the roster looks like for Cincinnati? Whether I don't think anybody would necessarily go into next season expecting Cincinnati to be a tournament team as it stands right now without knowing what the transfer portal looks like or anything like that. So you go into next season with a third-year coach who hasn't made the tournament, only has two quad one wins, hasn't won the shootout, and doesn't have a tournament team right now. He's that enjoying all, this right now, folks. That all sounds bleak. <laughs> that all that all sounds bleak. That sounds terrible. And I made the point about that after the after the shootout this past season. I, I did a podcast and I made that point. And I know a lot of Cincinnati fans were taken aback by that, and and it caused some frustration. And I said, "Look, I I understand that. Is West the guy? I have no idea. I have no idea because you you look at so many coaches now." You look at so many coaches that have figured it out after a little bit of time that have figured it out. And, and from the, from what I can tell, he has qualities to be the guy. But the question is, can he get his guys in there in enough time? Cause now you're going on year three and in, in a landscape like this, where if you're on the fence about a coach and Cincinnati fans should not necessarily be on like, this is not a, a get rid of him <laughs> take at all. I would never sit here and do that. I, I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, you're making a change after two years. But down the line, you look at how college athletics has shifted. And this goes back to what I was saying about the transfer portal. If you think four or five years down the line, maybe you've made a tournament, but the Big 12 is proven to be what the Big 12 is, and it's tough, and there's a lack of consistent success. You, you can't be afraid to make a change just because, oh, it's going to take four years in a rebuild. Look at what TJ Otzelberger did at Iowa State two years ago. Mm -hmm. Nobody thought uh, Iowa State, they, they're coming off, what, a two-win season? Nobody mm -hmm. thought they were going to win a game. Then last year, they go and they they make the NCAA tournament. Without a doubt, they're, they're running away into the NCAA tournament, and then they kind of faltered down the stretch, didn't have a great run. But still, point is that he turned things around real quick. You can do that if you are UC. You can go into the portal, and you also have things to build it. You have Victor Locken. You have you have people. You, you know Dan Skillings. Some of these guys that you know. What are you going to get out of a Dan Skillings? What are you going to get out of some of these younger guys? I know. Yeah, it, it's it's been a it's been a a weird transition, I guess, where you look at some of these transfers like Rob Finnessy, who hasn't panned out because he's been hurt. But like, does Josh Reed give you anything? Hensley, what is what is uh you know like a skillings, like I said, or 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 lock and some of these guys that you're looking to try and build this team around. Now, th the one thing I, I would caution everybody in listening to this, and trust me, I as somebody that you know has had some highly touted freshmen at, at Xavier over the years <laughs> and covered some of them that haven't necessarily panned out immediately. It's tough to expect a freshman class for as good as it is at Cincinnati to immediately come in and make an impact at the Big 12 level in year one. You just, it's just unfair to those guys to expect that right away. I feel like I've spent the last four minutes painting a bleak <laughs> picture of the future. And I don't mean to, I don't mean to do that because I do think with the freshman class that's coming in, there is a lot of, hope on the horizon there is a future there the question is can they do it in the big 12 consistently enough to get the tournament success that gets cincinnati back to the spot where you know every year the 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 shootout is a top 25 two top 25 teams playing against each other mm -hmm. and it's back and forth maybe one team wins two then another team wins one you know you, you trade back and forth both teams are top six seeds in the ncaa tournament i mean Heck, look at look at what Xavier did this year. I mean, they went from I was gonna say, yeah, like I mean, we have 
like the the picture perfect year one turnaround right like three miles down the road from us and that's why i think a lot of people are like upset with west because obviously situations were different but you see what sean miller walked into it I mean, Sean Miller didn't walk into, he walked into an NIT championship team, but he didn't <laughs> walk into like a bona fide, like top six seed NCAA tournament team. He built that team through the transfer portal. And there's maybe there's a chance that West could do that in this off season. I think this off season is going to be very interesting. Like, as you said, there's a lot of roster movement that could or could not happen. There's a lot of stuff. Even today, he was mentioning guys that could or could not come back. Like it, it's just going to be interesting to see, but I, I do think like, that's that's causing a little bit of anxiety around UC circles is the fact that Xavier just went from firing their coach this past off season already back up to what would you say, Paul, like a top four seed right now in the tournament? I, I would say they're tracking to be a, a top four seed. You know, we'll see how the next week or so plays out, but I would say as of, you know, tournament started today, they'd be a top four seed. Yeah. And I, comparing that with our team, who's losing road games to Tulane, East Carolina <laughs> and Temple, it's it's just a little bit different worlds and we're we're not entirely happy with that you know so yeah. i think like everything you said is just exactly spot on and you know maybe it's the big 12 thing where you know travis like i'll bring up travis Steele. you know like he was beating cincinnati but he wasn't getting to the ultimate goal of getting to the tournament so uh, xavier decided to move on and uh rehire sean miller and you know it's worked out for them and if and eventually you have to like move on from Wes and hire. That's just how college sports work. That's how sports work in general. You try, you, you got to keep trying and you can't just like, just, just say, okay, we're done on to the next one. I didn't like that. They gave him the extension this year when, mm -hmm. to be honest, I don't really know if he earned it just yet. There's no, like you said, Paul, there's like, we have two quad one wins and UCF is right on the border of a quad one quad two. So I don't even know if you can count that one really. He hasn't really had an, like a one unifying win either that has brought the entire fan base together to say, okay, this is our guy. We're behind him. I, I wouldn't call the Illinois win that because that was probably their worst performance of the entire season last year was that UC game. So I, you're preaching to the choir, here, Paul. Like there's a lot of <laughs> things that like there's a lot of questions that he needs to answer. And the hope is that he will. But I mean, now that you have you know more money with a Big 12 contract and you're in an elevated league, you give yourself an opportunity to say, okay, this isn't working. We should, we can go hire a new coach without financially bankrupting yourself. Like maybe you would have, if you were still in the American. One thing I want to jump in on here too, when we're talking so much about like kind of the big 12 and how things are going to change and, and the perspectives are going to change and you are going to be walking into a much more difficult league. And it's going to be harder to compete. Yada, 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 all this other stuff. One thing I think a lot of people miss is that as much as it might be hard and you might lose a lot, look at your like Texas techs and look at your West Virginia's of how their seasons have gone and look at how these teams that like granted, you know, a lot of these teams have kind of gone on runs and turned around and TCU now is just, uh, it's, it is what it is, but these teams get a lot of credit for losing to the teams in the big 12. There, like there is a collective effort of like uplifting. So it's one of those things like, you might not be able to beat Kansas for a couple of years. You might not be able to beat some of these crazy, like good big 12 teams. But if you can beat a couple of them, you're in a much better position looking at the tournament on the outside in where you're, where you're a borderline tournament team, you're a bubble tournament team just for playing these teams, just for playing within five of these teams versus if you're, you know, I think you get more credit, honestly, in the big 12 for losing to teams like Kansas, than you will ever get for two wins by 30 against, I don't know, Temple, against a USF. Like, you're not going to get credit for these wins in the same way that you're going to get credit for playing close to these really, really difficult teams to play. And so, I mean, you know, obviously, you you want to win those games, and maybe you do, maybe you don't, but I think that is one thing to keep in mind is that we'll probably have a better shot at the tournament next year than we do now even if we're not playing quite to the same level, even if we're playing at a lower level, we might still be a little bit closer, moving the needle a little bit closer. Do we have a, on paper, better chance in the, in the American? Absolutely. Did we get there? Oh, in Absolutely the not. <laughs> and so that's where it's a little, it's iffy, but. 
Well, it's 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 a rising tide lifts all boats type situation here with the Big 12. And when you get into it with Cincinnati, I, I think for me, the 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 thing that I'm going to be looking at out of Cincinnati in the next two years is the patience level. Right. Because last year you had you had the the college football playoff. Excitement, you had all of that. West Miller comes in in year one football dominates the first two and a half months of the season. Cincinnati gets that great win over Illinois. The football team's going to the playoff. I mean, there is just so much positive momentum in the athletic department. They're going to go to the big 12. I mean, there is just everything is going forward in the, in the athletic department. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, now fickle's gone. Satterfield's there. Things have stabilized more. And now you have to ask yourself, okay, two years from now, what does it look like? Do we have the patience? Because I think you should have the patience with a guy like Wes, who is coaching at this level for the first time going to the Big 12. I say, I mean, obviously he's been a Division One head coach, but going to the Big 12, this is going to be a massive step for him and, and for everybody around the program. So now all of a sudden you have to ask yourself as a fan base, what kind of patience level do we have? And also if you were say to not make the tournament after three years and say, you're not say Cincinnati's not close next year. I think they, I think they will be trending in the right direction more. So that there's a greater chance that Cincinnati trends in the right direction next year than they do in the wrong direction. I think the second half of this season has really given me in, in watching these Cincinnati games night in and night out. It's given me as a kind of neutral observer of this, you know, not, not having a stake in the game one way or the other. Um, it, it kind of looks to me like there have been signs of encouragement, what, how they've shifted JD's role, how they've uh, kind of started to attack differently now here down the stretch, how just some of the stylistic things that, that it feels like uh, Wes has done down the stretch. It just seems to me like I would at least be encouraged by the direction of what's happening here. And, and to that reason, you know, if, if we're talking about a team after that temple loss that had now lost 10 games down the stretch, and I don't know what the win total number is to, uh, down the stretch, but I don't think it's 10. I think it might be like seven that they've lost since then six or seven, but it's, you know, two of those were to Houston, two of those were to Memphis, right? It's not like, you have two two losses to Temple, two losses to South Florida, you know, and a bunch of bad losses in there. It's just the way that Cincinnati goes, and I don't want to talk myself into circles, but I think you'll find out a lot about Cincinnati in this next week, what kind of grit this team has, the toughness. You come off that close loss to Memphis. You probably beat SMU on senior night on Sunday, and then you roll the dice in the AEC tournament, and you hope – that 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 really continues things in the positive direction, and and then what happens in the transfer portal is the chips fall where they may. That's I right. have a right. question um, on that too. Oh, go, do you have yeah. something, Steve? Well, Justin, why, uh, why don't you wrap up with this? I don't want to take too much of uh, Paul's time. Yeah, no, no, go yeah. ahead. No, I'm enjoying this. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. This All is, right. You better. Well, <laughs> this is my last question for you, at least. Um, as a neutral observer and as somebody who I'm sure has seen probably a lot of this conversation, I brought this up today. People have been bringing it up every single day. And the closer and closer we get to the end of the season, the more gravity this conversation gets and the more the ball starts rolling on what do you do with Jeremiah Davenport and Mike Adams Woods and Landers Nolly and all these other guys who are, you know, who are at towards the end of their career who have a little bit of eligibility left. There's been a lot of noise. And I personally am against a lot of this scapegoating that's happened with JD. I think he catches way too much flack and it's because people are pissed off because the program's not what it should be. That is not one player's fault, but he catches all of the blame. And so I'm wondering, you know, from your perspective, when you look at a guy like JD, when you look at a guy like Maul, and these guys can come back next year, they have the chance to, do you keep them around this team? Do you think that makes sense? Or do you think it makes more sense to see, you know, play your hand in the portal and see what else you could find? I would. I, I really would keep them around because I think that going into going into the Big 12, I think there is something to be said for guys that have been around the program. Are they the most talented guys? Maybe not. 
right? I, I'm not going to sit here and say that maybe you can't go out there and find like at Xavier, you go out and find a Sule boom who was dominating at UTEP, you know, having a great time at UTEP plays Sean Miller at Arizona. And Sean goes, man, that guy was really good. <laughs> then when he comes available in a transfer portal, Sean goes out and gets him. And then this year is a biggest player of the year candidate. Could you go out and do that? Maybe, but this is a huge, huge step. It is. And people know that Cincinnati fans are smart. They know that they know that they know what kind of a position this program is in, in the big, in the uh, going into the big 12, but I liken this and not financially necessarily, but just the, the way I look at this, I kind of compare this situation to Butler where Butler made two straight national championship games back in the early 2010s. They had all this program momentum. They moved from the horizon to the A-10 quickly. Then all of a sudden, they got the Indianapolis market into the Big East. And since then, they've been competitive. They made a Sweet 16. But Chris Holtman left. LaVal Jordan came in. Nothing's really happened. Now Thad Mott is there. They've had a terrible year. It just it feels like they caught the wave. They rode the wave. The wave broke, and now what? Did Were they just good for a few years? Now, they have history. I get it. Hinkle Fieldhouse, everything. Butler's got history. I get it. So it's not, a, it's not an apples-to-apples apples comparison. But this is a very precarious time for Cincinnati where you got to hope the football hire is right. You got to hope that Wes Miller works out. And now all of a sudden you're going in and you're playing with the big boys, especially in basketball, you know, with Texas and Oklahoma leaving the football ball won't necessarily be the 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 cream of the crop without Texas and Oklahoma to the extent that basketball will I'm not saying I'm not that's not a knock on football <laughs> it's just that you're going to the best basketball conference in the country you are you're going to Allen Fieldhouse right you're going to Lubbock you're going to all these schools and you're thinking to yourself all right what are we doing now are we going and we're competing or are we going and we're taking a step back and to get back to your question it would help in my eyes, even though they're not the most talented guys, they are guys that have been there that know Wes they're stable. Maybe you reduce their role even more. If you have more talented guys that come in in the transfer portal and maybe you make that clear to them and understand it. But to me, it would seem to me that it would be more valuable to have some, some roster clarity and stability as you, take the biggest jump that this athletic department's maybe mm -hmm. ever taken. Yeah. This is a big yeah, thing that I definitely. talked on today. I mean, real I said it. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. I think my, my connection's weird. Go ahead, Justin. No, I was just saying that I talked about this today where I think our ceiling and our floor for these guys, you know what it is. You, you, you know exactly what you can get and you know how bad it can be. But when you look at, you know, a lot of transfers, it's always it's always a what if, maybe, hope. It, it, you're praying that these guys work out and you don't know what you're going to get. And sometimes you may get a guy who's going to, you know, hit the ground running like a DDJ. But then you also might get a guy like a Rob Finnessy or Kalu Zikbe who you, you know, expect like, oh my God, this guy averaged like a double-double. He's like a certified, you know, board getter. And then he comes in and he can't even get on the court. And so, you know, do you, yeah. do you get rid of your four year guys who are loyal to your program like that? And you know what you have in them for something like that. Also in a much harder conference. I, I think it's just, it doesn't make sense. The argument to me doesn't make sense why so many people push back on this, but the part that we're talking about here, we are the minority in this conversation. Yeah. Well, that, uh, well said by both of you. Um, I was going to make a big dip for my last question, but uh, I, I go think ahead, just, go ahead, uh, say nice it. Come on, do it. Is this the year they get to the final four? Come on, Paul, just tell me. I know the bracket's <laughs> not out yet, but just is this the year? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, is, uh, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if I don't know if this is the year and I'm not going to I'm not I won't I won't bore all the Cincinnati fans with uh, with too much Xavier talk. I don't know if this is the year. I think they have the offense to do it. Um, because I think that you get into a situation with Xavier this year where they can score. And me personally, I will always take teams over that can score over a team that can defend. I will always ride with a team that can put up a hundred points in a night and get into a track meet over a team that's going to slow you down like a Houston 
or like a UCLA or one of those that's going to slow you down. You get into those those slow types of games, and all of a sudden you think to yourself, "Uh oh, we're down six, but it feels like we're down 12. <laughs> Where are we going to get four baskets from here?" Well, Xavier's going to give you four baskets in about ninety seconds. So, right. can the defense hold up? Does Zach Fremantle come back? Who knows, fellas? We'll see. <laughs> but that's well, why it's March. You, you know is. UCLA's coach is great in March Madness games. So he's never no uh, doubt. Uh, been uh, been up by a, a wide margin in the second half and never never has. Stop, he's Steve. never been up by tw- he's never been up by 22 in the second half and lost. That's it was never hard happened. enough to move down to here. We don't have to be reminded. <laughs> I had to lob it up to you, but thank you Paul for joining us again everybody. Please check him out. Chatterbox Sports Rebound yeah. Rundown. Uh, it, I've been listening to it uh, every day, except for after the days that UC loses, because my heart still hurts <laughs> the next morning. But um, other than that, it's been it's it's a great show, great way to catch up, especially for someone like myself who does not live in the Cincinnati area anymore. It's a great way to stay connected. So thank you for so much for joining us. Paul. Hey, thank you guys. I, I love doing this. Anytime you guys want to have me on, I I mean, you guys are the best. I, I love talking hoops with you guys. And uh, yeah, like I said, thanks for listening. Um, it's great. It's, you know, it's 10 to 15 minutes every morning. It, if that some mornings it's shorter, um, but it's just kind of a quick, quick hitter on your day. And if anybody's listening, that's a Reds fan um, that knows Nick Kirby, Nick Kirby actually just started one the other day. He's going to do a morning commute podcast uh, for every Reds game this year. So uh, if you're a Reds fan listening to this and want just, you know, 10 to 15 minutes to catch you up every day on the Reds, <laughs> then uh, that's a great way to do it too. And it's all under chatterbox. So thank you guys for having me on anytime you guys want me on. I love to do it. Appreciate it. Thank you, man.